Well, good evening. I'm Pastor Paul Priest, and it's a joy to welcome you to our Wednesday night Bible study here at the Canon Baptist Church. On Wednesday evenings, we've been studying through the book of Acts, and so I'd invite you to open your Bibles with me tonight to Acts chapter 8, and uh, we'll begin in verse 26. We're looking tonight at the events connected to Philip the deacon who became really an evangelist. In the early days of my ministry, I was blessed to be given the opportunity to teach at the Bible Institute of Ohio. Uh, that was located in Columbus, Ohio. And during my time there, I taught two classes. One of them was the Book of Acts, and the other was Personal Evangelism. And I was always amazed at how clearly I saw personal evangelism demonstrated in the book of Acts. The Lord Jesus Christ had given this instruction to his disciples in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth, or to the end of the earth. The phrase there, you shall be witnesses to me, is evangelism. Evangelism is really the fulfillment of the great commission of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We've already seen in Acts chapter 2 that Peter evangelized the multitudes who were gathered on the day of Pentecost. And as Peter boldly proclaimed the gospel, many turned from their sins and they turn to Christ. Philip, the deacon Philip, was used by God to carry the good news of the gospel of Christ into Samaria. We talked about that over the past couple of Wednesday evenings. In tonight's scripture, we will see how the Lord led Philip to share Christ with a leader of Ethiopia. And I, and I think this Scripture tonight is a good example of what I call personal evangelism. And before I get into tonight's study, I, I want to give you a workable definition of evangelism. Evangelism is to so present Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit that men shall come to put their trust in God through Him, to accept Him as their Savior and serve Him as their Lord and the fellowship of the church. That's what I believe evangelism is. And we see it uh, in this scripture tonight. Look in verse 26, and, and I think you'll understand what I mean. Now, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. The points of our study tonight are simply to do with what evangelism is. And, and the first thing we see there is evangelism involves divine direction. Arise, go toward the south to Gaza. To be effective in ministry for the Lord, we must always be careful to follow the leading of the Lord. And the leading of the Lord is clearly evident here. God sends an angel to Philip with a clear message about where Philip is to go. Now, Gaza is the southernmost city of Palestine. The city is located near the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. Gaza is the last city on the way to Egypt. The journey from Jerusalem to Gaza was about 60 miles, but I, I think you can clearly see here tonight in Evangelism involves divine direction. The Lord told Philip where to go. And then evangelism involves willing obedience. I want you to know this, verse 27. What does it say? So he, meaning Philip, arose and went. I don't know about you. I have a tendency to say to the Lord when I sense the leading of the Lord, Lord, let me pray about that. Lord, let me prepare for that. That's a good idea. 
Uh, let me get ready for that. What did Philip do? He arose and he went. Now, I, I admire that. That's what I call obedience. Evangelism demands willing obedience. When Philip was given this call, he did not know what going, God was going to do with him. I'm sure it did not make sense to him to leave what he was doing and go to the desert near Gaza. God had blessed Philip's ministry in Samaria. People were being saved. Lives were being touched and changed for the glory of God. But Philip knew what God had told him to do, and so Philip did it. One of my favorite songs in the hymn book is a song that we sometimes sing, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than trust and obey. Amen? Whenever it comes to a choice between our way of thinking and what God says, you know as well as I do that there is no real choice. We must do what God says. Amen. If you and I read the Bible tonight and you and I understand what it is that God is telling us to do, we had better do it. God always honors and God always blesses obedience. Obedience is the only way you or anyone else will find blessing in the Christian life. And again, I, I want to emphasize this remarkable story illustrates for us the sovereignty of God. When you read the Bible, I think it is evident that God is in control. The Lord God Almighty, he rules in heaven and he rules in earth. I believe the sovereignty of God is in play here. God is orchestrating the events in the life of Philip as well as the events in the life of the Ethiopian eunuch. You see, the Lord will have to bring both of them together in the same place and at the same time. But now in verse 27 through 29, I, I think you'll see with me the, the third point that I want you to note in this scripture, and that is evangelism involves the Spirit's leading. In verse 27, it says, So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace the queen of the Ethiopians who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. Isn't that so clear? Evangelism, it involves the Spirit's leading. You see, Philip, he obeyed the angel of the Lord. He heard the message of God. There was no question. There was no debates. Philip just was obedient. He did what the Lord told him to do. And he met the minister of finance or the secretary of the treasury of Ethiopia. Now this man was part of a history that might have gone back 1,000 years. Ethiopia is a name that in ancient times was given to a large area of Africa, south of Egypt. And that day referred to the whole region of the upper Nile River. Uh, from the city of Aswan to Khartoum. This is the area from which the Queen of Sheba came to Jerusalem in the days of King Solomon. What I want you to see here is there had already been a link between that area of the world, Ethiopia, and Jerusalem for a thousand years. The Queen of Sheba had been greatly impressed by King Solomon and his wisdom and his wealth. And I think Solomon, no doubt, had certainly shared the scriptures, uh, the word of God, with her. And here in the time of the early church, there is an Ethiopian uh, leader who for some reason had gotten the idea that in Jerusalem, hundreds of miles away, there was a religion that he should investigate if he was serious about finding God. Perhaps it was something that this Ethiopian heard or some tradition that had been passed down to him. 
But this man, he, he held an important office in a large nation. He served under Candace, we read. Now, Candace was the queen mother of Ethiopia, and a queen mother in this time was very powerful. She literally handled the affairs of the kingdom. Now, I want you to understand tonight, Candace was not her name. It was the name of her title or her position, just like the word Pharaoh or the word Caesar or in the United States today, we use the president. It's, it's the position, the title. This Ethiopian eunuch, eunuch had traveled over 200 miles to worship God in Jerusalem, and yet his heart was still empty and not satisfied. To me, this Ethiopian it represents millions, millions of people who maybe have religion, but they don't know the Savior. He represents millions of people today who are sincere, but sincerely lost. Just like in his day, today there are many people who've read the Bible and have sought the truth, yet they don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I've learned this sad reality. A person can go to church. He can be a member of the church. He can read the Bible and still be lost and empty on the inside. In order to be saved, you need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You need to admit that you're a sinner and believe that God loves you and Jesus died for you. And then you call upon Jesus, trust in him as Savior and Lord. It's a dreadful feeling to be lost, isn't it? I think it's the worst feeling in the world. I heard Steve Wagers one time tell the story of a little fellow. He was standing on the side of the road. A man drove up, he stopped, he rolled down his window. He said, son, do you know how to get to town? The little fellow said, no, sir, I, I don't know. And then the man asked, well, son, do you know how to get to Route 20? The little boy again replied, no, sir, I don't know. And the man, the man again asked the little fellow, he said, well, where does this road go? And the little boy said, I don't know, mister. The man asked, well, do you know the name of this road? No, sir, I don't know, was the reply. Well, the man was frustrated at that point. And then he told the boy, son, you don't know anything, do you? That little boy smiled and he looked at the man. And he says, mister, I know I ain't lost. <laughs> Being lost, oh, it's a terrible, terrible feeling. This Ethiopian ruler was lost. When, but when Philip met this man, he just happened to be reading in the book of Isaiah. The Ethiopian ruler was on the right track, wasn't he? It, it, we're, we're commanded to search God's word, aren't we? And as this man was reading God's word, the Holy Spirit led Philip directly to the Ethiopian ruler. The Lord directed Philip to this man at the right time. You remember what I said to you about the sovereignty of God? God's working. God's moving. God brought Philip to the right place at the right time. It was a divine appointment. Look in verse 30. Philip ran to him, heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, and said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. And the place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? Philip ran to the chariot. He hears the man reading these verses from Isaiah 53. He asked him, if he understood what he was reading. And then the Ethiopian ruler admitted that he could not understand unless someone explained the scriptures to him. He was searching for some help. That is why the Lord sent Philip to this man. There's a verse of scripture that I want to remind you of tonight in Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 13. There the Lord says, and you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. I believe the Lord God Almighty looked down from the battlements of heaven. He saw this Ethiopian ruler seeking to know him. And I believe the heart of God was touched. 
And so God sent his angel to tell Philip, Philip, I've got a place for you to go. I've got a work for you to do. That is, I believe, the way that it works. Any person who's sincerely seeking God, I believe God will bring across their pathway someone to point them to Christ. Now, we need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading so that when God leads us to that person who's seeking him, that we can guide them into the truth. Amen. Philip offered to help this man. And the Ethiopian invited him to come and sit with him in the chariot. The Lord, you see, the Lord had prepared the way for Philip. The man had a teachable spirit. And you can help folks with that kind of attitude. Uh, he was reading in Isaiah 53. Notice verse 34. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I, I ask you of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or some other man? The Ethiopian wanted to know who Isaiah the prophet was talking about. Was he speaking about himself or was he speaking about someone else? Well, when you look at Acts chapter 8, you find there are three men mentioned here. Verse 27 talks about a man who was a sinner. A man that needed Christ and was burdened about his sin. That was the Ethiopian ruler. Verse 31 talks about some man who was a servant of God and pointed this man to Jesus Christ. That some man there was Philip. And then verse 34 talks about some other man who was the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who could save this uh, Ethiopian ruler's soul and forgive him of his sin. I want you to realize tonight that God has a plan not only to reach the, the multitudes on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, not only to reach the crowds of people in Samaria, but God also has a plan to reach the individual. God is always interested in the individual. Tonight, God loves you. Jesus died for you. He wants to save you. I read recently about Garland Cofield, who was a missionary bush pilot in Canada. I love to read missionary stories. They blessed me. They encouraged me. Garland Cofield would fly to Indian villages throughout the region of western Canada. He would share the gospel. Well, one evening while he was flying, he and a native traveling companion were caught in a terrible snowstorm, a blizzard. It was so bad they had to land the plane quickly, but finding a place to land was difficult. It was hard to see. And while they were looking down, they noticed a light. This light was from a cabin on the shores of a frozen lake, and they were able to land the plane on the lake, and then they knocked on the door of this remote cabin, seeking shelter from the storm. And a voice told them to enter. When they opened the door, an elderly Indian woman a woman who was blind was sitting in a chair next to a warm fireplace. Garland and his friend began to talk with this woman. And in the course of the conversation, they told her about Jesus Christ and about how to be saved. The woman said that when she was a little girl, she had heard the story about Jesus, but she didn't understand it. She told Garland that she had been praying and waiting all of her life for someone to explain to her the story of Jesus. And that night, this dear lady put her faith in the Savior. Well, the storm eventually cleared. Garland and his friend were able to fly back home. But this woman wanted to know the truth, and the Lord made sure that she had an opportunity to hear the truth so that she might put her faith and trust in Jesus Christ. The Lord arranged a divine appointment with a godly missionary so that she might come to know Christ. You see, our God is a sovereign God. He rules and reigns in heaven and in earth. Well, the last point that I want you to see about evangelism tonight is that our time is getting away from us. You, you find it in verse 35. Evangelism involves sharing Jesus. Evangelism involves sharing Jesus. Look at verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture preached to Jesus to him. I don't know what that does for you. That thrills my soul. 
That makes me want to shout amen and hallelujah and praise the Lord. Philip preached Jesus. Isaiah 43, or excuse me, Isaiah 53, portrays Jesus as the suffering servant who came to be our Savior. The verses of Isaiah chapter 53 contain the principle of vicarious atonement. Now that's two big words. What it simply means, it gives us the picture of a Savior who took our place, who died in our stead, who shed his blood to pay the debt of our sin. I owe a debt of sin that I could never pay. Jesus paid a debt of sin for me that he did not owe. Amen. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. My sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. There is no passage of scripture in all of the Old Testament that more clearly reveals who Jesus was and what Jesus did for us on the cross than Isaiah 53. Look at verse 4 of Isaiah 53. I think Philip would have shown how Jesus took up our infirmities and how he carried our sorrow. In verse 5 of Isaiah 53, I think Philip would have shown this Ethiopian ruler how Jesus was pierced for our transgressions, how Jesus was crushed for our iniquities. And then in verse 6 of Isaiah 53, I think Philip would have shown this Ethiopian ruler how we all like sheep have gone astray and how the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I've heard many preachers say that Isaiah chapter 53 is the gospel in the Old Testament. And what a passage of scripture it is. God has been leading in every step of the way. And as Philip explained the meaning of these words to the Ethiopian, Philip told him about Jesus. Jesus who fulfilled this prophecy precisely just a short while before. Philip showed that Jesus is the Christ. That he suffered the penalty of sin for all the world. That he rose from the dead and that he offers forgiveness and eternal life to anyone who trusts in him. And as Philip explained the verses to him, the Ethiopian began to understand the gospel. Why? Because the Holy Spirit of God was opening his mind to God's truth. Let me say this to you tonight. No man comes unto the Father unless the Spirit draws. When the gospel is proclaimed, the preacher shares the truth of who Jesus is, why Jesus came, what Jesus did for us, shedding his blood, rising again. But the message of the gospel, unless the Holy Spirit opens the heart, unless the Holy Spirit opens the eyes, it's not received. You see, it's the Spirit of God that draws people to Christ. Romans 10 and verse 17, I always remember when I'm sharing the good news of Jesus, the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Listen to Romans 10 and verse 17. It says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's the preacher's work to share the word. Amen. It's the teacher's work to share the word. It's the soul winner's work to share the word. And when the word is shared, faith comes by hearing. When you sow the seed in God's time, God brings the heart. Amen. So what happens here? Well, the Ethiopian believed on Jesus Christ. He was born again. And his experience was so real that he insisted on stopping the chariot and being baptized, baptized immediately. Oh, what a testimony. That is to me. This is a man who had found the answer. He had found the answer for his loneliness, Jesus Christ. He had found the answer for his sin, Jesus Christ. He, he had found the answer for peace in his soul, Jesus Christ. He wanted everybody to know what the Lord had done for him. And you know what the Bible says? He went on his way with joy. He, he went on his way rejoicing. We, we have a beautiful demonstration here, personal evangelism. I believe God calls every one of us who know him to be a witness for him. And all of us should strive to be a soul winner. Philip was a soul winner. May God help us to win souls to Christ as Philip did. 
I think you and I can become confident in and passionate about sharing our faith as we go through our daily lives. And as we go, we can inspire others to do the same. When we're at places like our work or at the grocery store or at the ball field, we're on a mission field. And we can change the world with the good news of the gospel of Christ if we'll just be faithful to share Christ with others. If we will live the life of Christ so that others see Jesus in us and we will share the love of Christ, then I believe people will listen to the gospel of Christ. God help us to be soul winners. A beautiful scripture tonight, Philippians, uh, or, or Philip, a master soul winner. What an example for you. What an example for me. Well, God willing, we, we look forward to seeing you all and Worship service, 1045, Sunday morning. We were blessed this past Sunday to have a good crowd of people assembling together for the first time, I, I think, in 11 Sundays uh, to worship God. It's hard to, to conceive of the fact that we went almost three full months without having God's people in God's house for worship. I, I hope and pray that you can join us. I look forward to seeing you if you can be here. Uh, but at any rate, our prayers are with you. If I can help you in any way, please call me. Uh, if you want to know how to have a relationship with Christ, I'd love to share with you the good news of the gospel. If, you, if you're uh, seeking victory in, in, in your Christian life, if there's an area where you're struggling, I'd love, I'd love to show you from the Bible that victory is in Jesus. I'd love to be able to talk with you and pray with you. So call me, 803-942-1273, if I can assist you, if I can help you in any way. Until uh, next time, God bless you.